Good morning, everyone, and thanks so much again for joining us for today's Agile Oversight Forum. Uh, my name is Matthew Winchell. I'm an Associate Program Analyst with the PRAC, uh, and I have the pleasure of hosting our opening discussion among four of the Oversight Community's most respected members, uh, PRAC Chair and Department of Justice Inspector General Michael Horowitz, Comptroller General of the United States Gene Dodaro, Chair of the PRAC Subcommittee on Health Care and the Department of Health and Human Services Inspector General Christy Grimm, and one of the driving forces behind today's event, uh, Chair of both the PRAC Audit Inspections and Evaluations Committee and SIGI's Audit Committee and the Small Business Administration Inspector General Mike Ware. Uh, first, I would like to thank all of you so much for being here today to discuss the importance of agile oversight what it means for the future of oversight across uh, federal, state, and local oversight shops, how you all are utilizing it in your organizations right now, uh, and what oversight professionals can start doing to incorporate these strategies in the work that they do. And right before this, we were able to hear from SIGI Chair and Department of the Interior Inspector General Mark Greenblatt about what agile oversight means to him. So I think that is a good place for us to start uh, today as well to understand what it means to, to all of you. So I'll turn it over first uh, to Mike Ware, um, someone who really inspired this event through his leadership on the Prax Agile Oversight Toolkit. Um, IG Ware, what do you think it means to be agile in what we do in the oversight business? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think probably if I wanted to break this down in the most simple ways, simple way, I think that to be agile in the IG community is to keep our oversight processes flexible and efficient while upholding professional standards. It means being timely in terms of getting information in the hands of decision make makers, allowing them to make decisions in real time to safeguard taxpayers' dollars and increase the integrity of the programs we oversee. Now, never was that more critical than during the pandemic with the signing of the CARES Act. And we needed everyone to know at that time what controls were necessary before the first loan was issued. We had three reports done in under 30 days providing guidance before the first loan was issued. And when SBA issued 14 years worth of lending in just 14 days, we knew that we needed to provide oversight in somewhat of a more real time format. It wouldn't have been helpful to anyone if we had conducted a traditional yellow book audit, for example, which could take, as we all know, between 10 months and a year when our stakeholders needed immediate information. In just two weeks after the first loan was issued, we had another report out detailing changes that needed to be immediately made. And that resulted in legislative changes and immediate program changes on the part of SBA. Now, because of the, the, the volatile and uncertain world we found ourselves in at that time, and even still now, we had to create the space for agile oversight as opposed to our traditional audit and investigative products. So understanding the need in combination with what we used here was like basic project management it is a skill that was leveraged among our oversight professionals. And because of their need to remain efficient and maintain the high standards, while keeping their eye on the mission, that was what was most critical in an agile environment. Thank you for, for that response. And I think uh, I can speak for all of us when we're, we're really impressed with the work that SBA OIG has, has done, especially um, in the pandemic as it relates to agile oversight. Um, I'd love to hear from the rest of you as well. Um, how about we uh, transition to, to Michael, um, then Christy, uh, and then Jean. Great, thanks. And uh, I, I, I won't repeat everything Mike just said because he summarized it so well. And uh, you're right, Matt. It's um, you know the the work that SBA OIG did was demonstrative of what it meant to be agile and flexible. Um, for all the reasons Mike said, I'll just add um, uh, further uh, re reasons for it. Um, when the pandemic hit, but just in our day to day jobs. Um, where our mission is to help improve government programs and program integrity. Um, and that means if we have the expertise, which we do, to immediately get on issues like SBA OIG did at the start of the pandemic, we need to do that. And we need to be able to produce information promptly to policymakers 
so programs can be fixed promptly. Hopefully, they will get fixed promptly. Um, in some cases, the agencies listen to us. In some cases, they don't always listen to us. But our responsibility as IGs is to help the agencies improve their programs, um, get them information promptly, help policymakers and Congress and throughout the executive branch um, to be able to address issues and for the public to see how those um, programs are operating. We don't, we're not just in the business of uh, chasing the fraud afterwards or issuing recommendations a year later saying, boy, you should have fixed this a year ago when we know right at the bat, as again, SBOIG did when they issued their flash reports about how important it is to stop and address things right away. So that's the other reason I think it's very important to keep this in mind. Um, and they need to be agile, they need to be getting product and information out as promptly as we can so that programs can be improved. Thank you for those insights, Christy. Uh, what, what do you think? Uh, thanks, Matt. I do want to acknowledge just what a pleasure it is to be part of this uh, panel to talk about how agile practices um, do maximize timely relevant oversight and how uh, we have seen them shine more light for the public on the operations of the federal government. Um, I'm a big fan of agile oversight and what it, what it means. I think it has tremendous potential to allow for us to meet the moment. And uh, you've heard from Mike and Michael about uh, during the pandemic, how agility was really called for. So, it, it, you know, agile oversight does allow us to meet that moment, whatever that moment might be. And we have seen in recent years, um, new oversight needs are coming at us uh, in fast, in unexpected ways. And Agile means that we have an expanded menu of options to oversee fast-changing, complex federal programs, massive federal investments in emerging risk areas. And uh, frankly, Agile uh, offers more options for efficiency with scarce resources, and we all have scarce resources. Um, I, I want to set up just a little bit of a framework for how I'm going to talk about Agile. It's, uh, it has uh, three compelling attributes for me, what I call the three big R's. It's results oriented, it's responsive, and it is reflective. Um, and I'll just explain very briefly what I mean by that, and then I'll thread it in a little bit later. But it does allow us agility to uh, deliver results, largely through data, through data sharing, um, through agile methods that prevent fraud, that avoid misspent funds, and that protects patients. It's responsive uh, to immediate to time sensitive needs um, to help programs be alerted sooner to, in order to help protect people and programs faster. And it allows for this concept uh, of being reflective for continuous learning. We all are learning from one another horizontally with our partners in the IG community and vertically within our own organization and with agile methods um, we do, we learn, we adjust, and we keep going and repeat that cycle as needed. So that's what Agile Oversight means to me. Thanks, Christy. And I really like the idea of meet the moment. I think it's really a great theme to approach Agile with. And I think a lot of the things you touched on are going to be really threaded throughout this entire day. So thank you for, for that insight. Um, Jean, uh, what do you think it means to be Agile in, in what we do in Oversight? I think it's important for our oversight organizations to be able to adapt quickly and to respond promptly to discuss issues of national importance, both contemporary issues, but also issues in advance. Now, what we've tried to do at the GAO is embody these concepts into the culture of the organization. We're organized in a way to enable us to respond quick, quickly and to adapt. We're set up in a matrix organization with subject area experts and technical experts that can be deployed very quickly to address the many issues uh, that we're asked to address. So Agile is built into our organizational structure at GAO. Uh, secondly, it's in our operational concepts as well. Every audit that we do, and we do six, 700 audits a year here, 
uh, is has a tailored uh, team put together specifically to meet the objectives of that audit uh, in a matrix fashion. And then lastly, you know, be able to respond to emergencies. Uh, this is very important. I mean, we had this over the years in many forms, natural disasters, Hurricane Katrina uh, back in 2006 or 2005, 2006 period, the global financial crisis, 2008, we had to pull a team together to be on site at the Treasury Department the day the law was passed, granting the $700 billion troubled asset relief program to unfreeze the credit markets. Uh, and uh, we had to report every 60 days on that effort, work with the Treasury Department to try to build in proper controls up front. The American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, uh, we had to deploy people to uh, 16 states across the country to track the $800 billion stimulus package that was passed. And we used re-employed annuitants from GAO who are actually living in those states uh, to augment our resources. So that was another means of, of agility to be able to look quickly. And then most recently in the pandemic, you know, where we've had to track the 400, uh, or excuse me, $4.6 trillion uh, to augment uh, some of the responsibilities that the <clears throat> PRAC has been doing. Mostly we've been focused on what impacts it have on public health and on the economy. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we've been, had to report monthly uh, to congressional committees and briefings and report bi-monthly uh, to the public and others. Now, the last thing I, I'd say about the Agile, it also requires integrated approaches where you bring interdisciplinary teams together to meet the particular unique needs of your assignments that you're given, those that you anticipate and those that are unanticipated. So you can move quickly and then you leverage networks that have been established in, in all of these cases, you know, we work very closely immediately to set up networks with the state and local audit communities where a lot of these natural disasters and emergency, you know, really hit uh, home in those areas. And the first thing I always do is talk to the IG community immediately. Michael Horowitz was the first person I called once the CARES Act was passed in March 2020. And we agreed to work together, bring in the IG community and created a network where we could leverage each other's skills and make sure we weren't uh, duplicating one another. And we're leveraging our resources, as Christy mentioned, you know, we all have limited resources. This helped us to respond quickly in an efficient and an effective way as Mike Ware was talking about, where we could give uh, good recommendations that meet our quality standards in a timely fashion so that agencies could act on them quickly. Thank you, Gene. I really liked where you talked about the, the integrated um, approach. And I think that's a theme we'll be touching on later uh, in the day. And thank you all for your enlightening insights um, as to what agile oversight means at, uh, for U.S. leaders in, in practice. And what your responses point out too is that that while there may be a somewhat general understanding of what agile is, there there's still some flexibility in what it looks like in practice. And related to actually practicing agile oversight, I think something that we've often heard across the oversight community is that there's this hesitancy, right, uh, to put it into practice. Um, because our community is so committed to maintaining the highest standards in our work. And sometimes the perception is that this type of work uh, doesn't really fit into those standards. So Gene, I wanna come back to you to address this concern that we often hear that agile oversight is somehow in conflict with accurate or thorough oversight. Um, in other words, can you please tell us a bit more about how we can both sure. embrace agile while still maintaining those foundational principles of oversight um, that so many in our community rightly value? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I do not believe these two concepts are in conflict uh, if you have the right mindset in taking the approach. I remember back, I became acting controller general in March, 2008, just as the global financial crisis was unfolding. Uh, and uh, the Federal Reserve chairman 
Ben Bernanke and Secretary Paulson from Treasury went to the Congress and said, we need $700 billion to uh, deal with this. Or we're going to go into a depression. And uh, so I said, we need some accountability over that. And so Congress added these things and put the requirement in force, to, as I mentioned, to be on site, but to report every 60 days. Now, I, I received some internal resistance in GAO along the lines of what you're talking about. But my point to our organization was if Congress and the American people can't rely upon us in a national emergency to adjust and adapt to help deal with the, the needs of the country from an accountability standpoint, what good are we as an audit organization? And you can scope the work properly to meet your standards. I mean, all the standards do is say, you know, based what quality controls need to be put around uh, the scope of the audit work that you intend to perform. And you can scope the work to meet any time frames that you have uh, in, a, in a quality manner. So you don't have to sacrifice quality in order to do this. I mean, the first TARP report we issued in the first very 60 days, it was November or December 2008, the legislation passed in October, we had nine recommendations to the Treasury Department. I testified before the Congress, the hearing went five hours because Treasury didn't agree to implement all our recommendations. And it wasn't until the hearing was over that they finally agreed uh, to do that. But that program ended up receiving most of the money back uh, that was lent out. It really didn't have a lot of, of, of problems. It wasn't a very popular program, uh, but it ended up meeting its objectives and helping uh, deal with our country. And I use that as one example. But the bottom line is, Matthew, you can do this. In fact, it's incumbent upon us as accountability organizations to, as, as uh, Christy said, we gotta meet the moment and, and you can do it in a quality fashion uh, without sacrificing any of the normal standards that we need to, to meet. There's nothing in the yellow book that says the longer you take, the higher the quality work uh, is. Definitely. Thank you so much, Gene, for that. Um, Michael, I'm curious about your take on this question, that there's this concern that agile work and the standards that we adhere to might somehow be in conflict. What do you think? Yeah, look, as usual, I agree with Gene and everything he said. Um, <laughs> and of course, you know, GAO is the keeper of the yellow book. And so um, I, I, and I completely agree with the last sentiment, because I think sometimes there's this sense of, well, the yellow book requires us to spend a year to a year and a half doing an audit. Um, and really what it turns on is, as Gene said, it's, it's how you scope it and what your purpose is, not what's in specifically the yellow book that requires a certain length of time. Um, and, and I think demystifying that is critical. And I think programs and discussions like this are very important to it. I've heard that in my own organization. Um, Mike and I talked about this, I think, right at the outset of the pandemic, because the two of us were at a congressional hearing right at the outset, remotely, when that was the question from Congress, which is, how are you going to get us stuff quickly? We don't, it, we love your reports. It's nice to read a 50-page report a year from now, but we're in a crisis and we need it now. And, you know, I think part of my job as PAC chair has been working with the IGs and working with Gene and his team at GAO to take that out of the sort of mindset of, well, we need to spend all this time to do an audit appropriately. That's not what the standards say. Mike Ware is the chair of our audit committee in the SIGI community. Um, Gene, as I said, is, uh, and GAO uh, is responsible for the Yellow Book standards. I've never heard, uh, and I don't, I'm not an auditor, so I'm the, I'm the least likely one to give advice on this compared to Gene and Mike, but I, it, it's simply not the case. I, I think it, it's reminding people, for example, in the organization like mine, we've long done management advisory memos. Others call them flash reports. There, there's various nomenclature used. It doesn't mean that what we're issuing has no standards. 
In fact, they have very rigorous standards. We're very careful with what we put out. We make sure that they meet SIGI standards and for yellow book reports, yellow book standards. But I don't think time is the measurement of meeting standards. Definitely. And thank you for those insights. I think, you know, both answers show that, you know, agile doesn't necessarily imply lack of standards. And, you know, there's some level of, of complement, right, between agile work um, and, and our standards. Moving beyond just looking at standards, um, implementing agile strategies can still be a challenge for some offices. Um, ultimately, for many offices, it's a new way of doing things. It requires a new approach um, and sometimes a cultural shift. Um, often one that's unnecessary, um, depending on the circumstances. And each of your organizations, um, for example, has in many different ways had to move to agile approaches in order to meet your mission. Um, and specifically in light of recent challenges uh, through surges in pandemic relief um, and other types of funding. So Christy, for those of us who may be in organizations that haven't quite yet made that full pivot into agile approaches, can you tell us a little bit more about how an oversight organization can more broadly move to that type of posture? Um, I mean, I think I can speak for, for a lot of us when I say that HHS OIGs moved agile, um, especially at the beginning of and throughout the pandemic has really uh, been incredibly impressive. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Matt. And I, you know, when I hear about moving an organization, I do immediately think about shifting a culture. A lot of the things that Jean was talking about that GAO has developed internally and culture shifts do take, a, take time. Let's just acknowledge that you generally need um, good infrastructure, resources, data, analytics, a talented workforce that works well together, a tone that is set from the top, um, allowing for and promoting agility and experimentation, and a team of leaders who communicate about why agility matters and how it aligns with an OIG's mission. I do think um, you need to make a business case for Agile in a way that sticks. Um, in our shift uh, toward Agile methods over truly the last decade and a half, I've put a, we have put a great deal of focus um, on increased opportunity to have ever more effective and efficient results because that can have a contagious effect. When people see that agile methods can work effectively to advance our mission, uh, enthusiasm for and confidence in agile approaches spread. And uh, to do this, uh, we're constantly here at HHS focused on the outcomes of what that programs are trying to achieve. So uh, folks had talked about programs under their purview here at HHS. The Provider Relief Fund, uh, a CARES Act program, $178 billion that provided emergency relief to hospitals and other healthcare providers. The goals there were, of course, to get money to eligible providers swiftly and to ensure that funds weren't diverted to fraud. And we knew immediately um, that when the program was announced, that we would need to audit it eventually. But as all of the speakers here today have acknowledged, full-blown audits can take months, if not years. And uh, time doesn't necessarily mean quality and time sometimes doesn't necessarily mean meeting the moment. Uh, so in the meantime, as money was flowing out the door, we looked at what we could do. And what we did immediately was we provided the department with curated insights and learning gleaned from prior OIG grants and contracts oversight uh, work. And the approach really aimed to spark the department's thinking about program integrity guardrails as it rushed to set up the program in mere weeks. And practically speaking, they weren't gonna take the time to go read a 50 page report, um, to cull through our past work looking for program integrity ideas. So we did that for them. We found that the department was not only receptive, but it invited this input. And along those same lines is the experience several of us have had as PRAC members in partnering with PRAC and OMB to provide program integrity technical assistance. And this assistance is truly just designed to help departments think through how best to build program integrity guardrails into the new 
COVID-19, American Rescue Plan programs. And we focused on things like uh, the role of performance metrics and data in ensuring program operations, oversight activities that might be employed during the pandemic until things like in-person site visits uh, could be safely conducted, and lessons learned about uh, program designs based on our prior experience with emergency response with grants oversight and emergency payments. Concrete, practical technical assistance grounded in our oversight expertise that could bring focus to program integrity and help prevent fraud. And uh, Agile has provided us a helpful tool for preventing and curbing risks for harm, significant harm to beneficiaries and to programs. I love the quote in the PRAC Agile Toolkit Mike, about how the public and policymakers demand, expect, and deserve more timely reporting of potential risks and management concerns. And so we've answered the call here at HHS in a variety of ways to get timely information into the hands of policymakers and the public. Um, one agile approach being piloted by our evaluators is something that we're calling our rapid assessment framework which gets near real-time observations on potential vulnerabilities into program administrators' hands. And I'll just very briefly explain. During an ongoing review that we have right now of CDC's vaccine administration program, we share preliminary information on challenges that we identify with CDC, allowing them to address awardee challenges in a time-sensitive manner. As a result of some of our interim observations, CDC, the agency that runs Medicare, CMS, and FEMA has addressed vaccination reporting data limitations and improved information for the public on vaccines. So through this RAF, the Rapid Assessment Framework, these course corrections could happen while our review is still underway. Now I know that viewers, a few listeners right now might be thinking again about those uh, SIGI standards and the commitment OIGs make toward transparency of uh, program vulnerabilities. Just because we're providing information as we go doesn't mean it's not documented and communicated. Um, the rapid assessment framework meets SIGI standards and the public facing report when completed will document identified vulnerabilities. The beauty is that uh, important vulnerabilities can be corrected as we go and programs are made better for it. Uh, and based on this experience, we're, you know, we're further developing that rapid assessment framework as an agile tool in our toolbox to use as appropriate. Thank you, Christy. Um, like I said earlier, what your agency has um, been able to do during this time has been quite impressive. So thank you for, for those insights. Um, Mike, your organization has also had to make a huge shift in how you conduct work um, in light of the massive amounts of, of funding that SBA became responsible for with administering several pandemic relief programs. So can you tell us a bit about not only how you moved more broadly to this agile posture in your OIG, but also touch on how you've continued to empower your staff to do the same? Um, as we said earlier, moving to an agile posture can often take this cultural shift um, which, of course, uh, requires staff at all levels to commit to a new mindset and how uh, oversight can um, and should be conducted. So I think uh, we are all definitely interested in your thoughts on how we can more effectively make the agile mindset uh, a part of our organizational cultures. Yeah, the agile mindset, it's everyone in my office has heard me speak of the definition of timeliness. And this is how I went about it here. They've heard me speak multiple times on the definition of timeliness and how it is expressed differently in different languages. Timeliness in the English language generally speaks to chronological order and that's it. But that's not the only way to express it. In the Greek, there are two words for time. Chronos, which speaks of chronological order, but there's also kairos. And kairos speaks of, of of a perfect moment or a special opportune time. Um, I think the, the, the definition speaks to a time designed for such a time as this, whatever this is. In our case, that this was relevant and impactful insight that would shift the way these programs were being run from an internal control and risk management standpoint. 
we were strategically looking for a Kairos opportunity in order to be relevant. That's what I was selling. So from a cultural perspective, selling relevance and Kairos wasn't that difficult. People jump at the opportunity to do impactful work that they can see the direct result of. They can point to a specific product, a specific legislative change, a specific policy change and said, and say, I did that. And another thing that was that we, we were not afraid to figure out exactly how we were going to do this on the fly either. Our culture is one that rewards innovation is baked into the strategic plan. And that reward structure played a huge role in cementing the process. The teams that were on the forefront of driving those legislative and um, um, programmatic changes, they were publicly recognized and rewarded because they stepped up to the plate and delivered. And the work that those teams did also played a huge part in the development of the Agile Work Products Toolkit. So it was hard to argue with, um, with, 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 with success. But if I could pivot a little bit, talking about um, the shift of culture a little bit, dealing with people who generally look at the yellow book in one way and one way only, like, like Michael pointed out, I'm the chair of the audit committee. I am a career auditor. I am a yellow book acolyte, right? So going back to folks to sell this from that position would have been so much more difficult if not for pushing the culture shift back to Kairos and in terms of timeliness and relevance. So, but, but moving to that agile mindset as part of our culture was a byproduct of necessity. We, we, we had no, no choice if we were going to be relevant. And um, it's what the late, great Earl Devaney taught me. Every good IG must have multiple tools in their toolbox and must be willing to deploy the right tool at the right time. And for us, Agile Work Products was the right tool at the right time. So shifting in terms of a cultural perspective was not that difficult once impact was um, seen. Thanks so much, Mike. I really like the the concept of the right tool at, at the right time. I think that's really impactful. And, and thank you both for those insights and, and really taking the time to consider the holistic approach a, a transition like this takes. Um, so, so far, we've talked a lot about what Agile is, um, what it can look like in action, but I would really like to turn our attention to the, the so what of Agile. Why is it critical? Why is it, why is it needed? Michael, um, as we've heard from your colleagues, you know, so much of the importance of agile oversight is this ability to provide stakeholders with timely and relevant information. And, and you, of course, are, are no stranger to speaking to any number of interested stakeholders, such as policymakers in Congress, uh, members of the media, or, or the American public. So could you talk to us more about what our stakeholders are looking for from us as oversight entities and how agile oversight plays a role in meeting those needs for information. Yeah, uh, happy to. And the insights that you've heard from Christy, Jean, and Mike have uh, really explained what this issue is and why it's so important. The, you know, it really doesn't. It, it, whether you're talking about the executive branch, Congress, the public, and when a pandemic hits, when an emergency hits. They want to know are the programs running the way they should, and is the money and the support and the health care getting to the people who need the help? They want that addressed right away. They want it fixed right away if it's broken. Telling them two years into the pandemic, telling right folks in 2022 what was going wrong in 2020, not so much help, right? By then, $4 trillion is out the door. If we had waited for two years, right, there's $5 trillion allocated, about $4 trillion was spent in two years, or, or at least obligated, right? That, coming out with reports in 2022 said, well, you could have done a better job in 2020, and here's some recommendations for the next $5 trillion pandemic. I'm not sure how much we would have gotten pats on the back for our work, right, at that point. So... It's critical no matter who you talk to. And we work ultimately for the public. And the public 
and the people who are intended to benefit need that right away. And I, and I agree with what uh, Christy, Jean, and Mike have talked about in terms of culture and, and having people within their organizations understand and think about these things. First of all, you have to have the dialogue with your folks and let them know why this is so important, even if we may understand it because we're the ones getting the incoming questions. Um, you need that dialogue with your, your folks. Uh, but I'll, I'm going to, I want to mention one place where I saw this happen in real time in 2021. And Mike Ware was there right at the outset, which was what have now come to be known as gold standard meetings. So uh, that wasn't an agile event or, or, or product put out necessarily. But what happened in 2021, using SBA OIG as an example, uh, Mike had put out Lot, his office put out lots of product in 2020 explaining what was going wrong and what needed to get fixed. And not much of it was getting fixed um, and getting addressed. Um, one of the things that started occurring in 2021 was when we were interacting with OMB leadership and with the uh, team that was responsible for implementing the American Rescue Plan in 2021, which ended up with broader responsibilities for pandemic oversight, was figuring out how we got everybody at the table. And, and what became known as gold standard meetings were meetings where um, the inspector general, the PRAC, the agency, and OMB leadership, and the American Rescue Plan leadership all came together in a room. Christy was at many of those meetings as well to talk about implementation plans by the agency had, because it's obviously, we're not management, it's up to the agency to do the implementing. They would explain the plans. And at that discussion, IGs like Mike Ware and Christy, and there's teams that know these things inside and out would ask the hard questions. Um, and that resulted in, in some instances, changes in how programs were put together. Christy referenced the dialogues that occurred both before and after those meetings that occurred that resulted in real changes. Those were real-time discussions. We weren't management. We weren't under owning the management responsibilities. We were keeping ourselves independent. What we were doing was using our expertise to ask the hard questions that people needed to ask so that the managers the supervisors, the leaders of the organizations could effectively implement a program. Um, and that the ground rules at the outset were that we weren't giving the good housekeeping stamp of approval to any of these programs. We were there to look at them, at, to, to, to ask the hard questions about what was being put forward. Um, and that I think was a significant change in how not only we think as IGs, but how agencies have to think and how OMB leadership has to think. And I remember when this, we started these and there were some concerns about it. I, I think Jean spoke about this and I spoke with Eugene at um, our first year anniversary program at the PRAC, which was in um, April of 2021 and how um, doing business was critically important and not inconsistent with the yellow book, not inconsistent with us being independent, but rather was we were doing exactly what the public and the taxpayers would expect of us, which is using our considered informed knowledge to ensure that programs were being run right at the outset, not a year later or two years later. And that was an agile product, I would say, um, that's been a changer. And for those who are uh, participating in this webinar in 2022, OMB put out a memorandum that institutionalized that. It's it's memorandum 22-04 if you want to read it from OMB. And I think that has transformed in many significant ways how we do our business. Thank you, Michael. I, I think the picture you just painted of agile work is so important to help get us as oversight professionals to this better understanding of both the implications and, and the usefulness of, of Agile. 
And in the in the same way agile products are important, Gene, I think it's also worth noting that even though we are talking about the importance of agile and culture shifts to meet this need, it doesn't mean that the traditional performance audit or financial audit goes away and aren't still just as important as they've always been. Um, it seems to me what we've all been saying is that uh, there's a time and a place for all types of tools. Um, and, and like Mike said, Agile is simply another tool in the oversight, oversight toolkit. So do you think that is a fair assessment? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I think that, uh, I mean, by definition, a financial audit can only be performed after the financial statements are prepared. <laughs> And, and uh, you know, while you do work uh, common with that, but I mean, uh, that's always going to be a case. Now, sometime in the future, Matthew, you're young enough, you might see financial audits, if blockchain technology is used, being able to do be done in real time as the transactions are being uh, carried out. Uh, but right now, uh, that's in a, in a post uh, anti audit uh, experience. Performance audits are the heart of what we do at GAO. Uh, and they're very, very important. Uh, and you need performance audits uh, to really dig de de deeply into the, whether or not the program's meeting its objectives, how to make it more efficient and effective. And in many cases, you need to talk to the recipients of the assistance and, and have a way to evaluate whether the program is meeting its intended objectives. But you need agile in your portfolio. You also need in your portfolio how to anticipate emerging issues and get ahead of them. You know, we haven't talked about that. We've talked about the traditional work and agile work and real time experience, but it's also important to get ahead of issues. We identified computer security as a high risk area across the entire federal government in 1997. We identified critical infrastructure protection as a high risk area across our entire economy in 2003. Now that helped us get a head start uh, and move the government in a proper direction. But as you know, current events have unfolded, technologies more, been more sophisticated and so have cyber criminals and others intent on harming things. And we become as a society more dependent on computers. We were able to get ahead of that uh, issue ahead of time and still, you know, be in a position now to, to kind of evolve and provide um, assistance to keep us ahead of that evolving threat, which is evolving very rapidly, in some cases, faster than the government's ability to, to deal with it, uh, the threat issue. But we're much better prepared now uh, because of those abilities to focus on it. So, you know, we, we need all these tools. But the one important thing I want to emphasize, though, is this is a way of solidifying the audit function and the accountability function as a constructive force for change. Um, you know, you, you uh, auditors always had the, the reputation years ago of, you know, coming in after the fact, criticizing people, and, you know, and, and sometimes making recommendations, but it was too late and uh, too little, too late. And so I think this is a way of really re-imaging ourselves as a vital part of any management at any time in a program's life, not just after the fact. And it's a very, it's, it's vital to, as Mike said, our relevance. I mean, we need to be relevant now and in the future. And there's no question that events are moving faster now you take science and technology is another issue. I'm trying to get ahead of, we just introduced a framework for how to audit algorithms under artificial intelligence, quantum computing's down the road. You know, these are things we need to get ahead of as a profession in order to make sure that we're relevant. Uh, otherwise, you know, uh, we're not gonna provide the type of support to our government and importantly, the American people that they're relying on us to do. Thank you so much for those insights, Gene. And they're super, super critical to understanding how Agile really fits into what we do. Um, 
Christy and, and Mike, I would like to bring it back uh, to you, um, to the insights you laid out about how our organizations can you know, ensure we shift to more agile approaches when called for. Um, I think it's worth noting that organizations like yours have done so incredibly well due to leadership's commitment to the approach. Um, so could you both speak to what you believe is a leader's responsibility to help move their organization in this direction? Um, no matter where they sit in an organization, right? Um, as I'm sure you can both attest that leadership really does uh, happen at all levels. So uh, Christy, why don't you start first and then we can turn it over to Mike. Okay, um, I do, I couldn't agree more that leadership does need to happen at all levels of an organization to help set the vision and create a little bit of psychological security, if you will, around agile um, oversight in terms of responsibilities, they're the but of course we you know we do have to make sure we're working within our authorities and meeting standards of excellence. Um, we have to make sure that we're being consistent and um, almost relentless in communicating about the value of agile oversight. In my view, um, that leadership commitment has to extend to engaging with external stakeholders as well. You heard a lot at the beginning around um, Congress really calling on the OIG community to be more agile, uh, faster in getting out uh, timely information. But I still think we need to be talking to them about what these agile products are and more importantly, what they are not so that they're understanding it correctly. And we have to, I have found that it's important that to socialize the new approaches uh, with programs we oversee. So program administrators, administrators are um, accustomed to an OIG business line. Um, even in organizations like mine where we're, you know, we've got um, toolkits and data briefs and the rapid assessment framework, um, it's still important uh, that they understand the program administrators what we're doing um, when we're handing them a report on say early insights about infrastructure programs that haven't even been stood up yet. Without a proper understanding, they may believe the agile product is, you know, uh, really off base, unfair, or that they haven't yet had a chance to get it right when in actuality, we're talking about capacity to stand up these uh, programs and we're offering these insights to avoid uh, uh, you know, mismanagement and waste. And we have experienced this reaction here at HHS and it's leadership's role to really bridge that divide to be communicating, you know, horizontally and vertically. Um, but I think the most crucial area of responsibility um, when you're doing agile oversight is to have that continuous learning mechanisms to sort of know what's uh, working and what isn't. Um, like I said earlier, you do, you reflect, you learn, you adjust, and you keep going. And it, um, and that, and that, does, that reflectiveness, that continuous learning enables um, our organization to improve at using agile work uh, to prevent harm and to get results for program. That feedback loop is uh, just imperative. And here in our organization to sort of support that continuous learning and reflectiveness, um, we utilize things like a weekly meeting where our executives, our top leaders are tasked with um, looking at investment decisions and thinking about how we design, how we scope, whether what kind of product is best suited. And we have a COVID-19 group that's led by our chief medical officer strategizing what types of proposals for in the COVID space maximize impact given the limited resources. Um, and these investment deliberations do ingest and apply what we know about what worked well and what didn't, right? Um, I think it's also leadership's responsibility, and this was talked about um, at a few points to ensure that, you know, uh, one size doesn't fit all not, you know, like a, a pulse survey doesn't work in all places. A data break doesn't work in all places. Technical assistance and give information as you go doesn't work in all instances. Circumstances are important and, um, and discussions around what makes the most sense uh, really does matter. 
So the socialization aspect, I think today's discussion will go goes a long way um, toward talking about the value of agile oversight tools like PRAX, uh, over, agile oversight toolkit, information sharing that takes place weekly um, through the PRAX subcommittees, well, really daily, uh, and provide us with incredibly valuable information as we learn from one another about approaches and successes. So, you know, Matt, thanks for organizing this event. Um, and I'll just say one of the things that I am most proud of uh, in my organization is really how much we and our leaders, because this, this question is about leadership, value innovation and the ability to test out new products like the ones we've talked about. It's really critically important that you do have both buy-in and execution from your leaders. Thank you so much, Christy. I really liked what you talked about, about the continuous learning. I think that's so critical to kind of moving into this, um, into this posture. Mike, what, what do you think? What, um, what do, what's the leader's responsibility to help move their organization in this direction? Hmm. I think a leader's responsibility, well, if we're speaking about the, 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 the top, right, it's to provide that strategic lens that brings people together to understand the necessity of relevance at a time the nation needs them the most. I am unbelievably fortunate to have bright, innovative, engaged people throughout the office that are super dedicated to the mission of protecting America's small business owners and the programs that support them. I, that cannot be understated. So it's, it's not that difficult to inspire and lead them no matter how much strategic lens I think I'm providing. <laughs> we have invested heavily in a self-leadership model internally that has paid huge dividends in terms of our people feeling individual ownership over their work products and over the processes that, that they use to, to produce timely work products. As the head, once again, I was able to provide that strategic lens to Agile Oversight products, which an auditor, auditor or investigator or data analyst may not have had at that time at the beginning. Like, like Michael said, we're sitting in a congressional hearing where they're in essence demanding that we provide timely and relevant information. So that, that strategic lens ensures that we are producing work that takes into consideration the needs of our customers, um, takes into consideration our changing environment and our mission. And like I mentioned earlier about um, Pyros in terms of timeliness, it's a lens that keeps Pyros at the forefront of our approach to timely and relevant oversight. Honestly, that's all that was necessary. Our self-leaders took it from there. Amazing. Thank you so much, Mike and, and Christy, for those insights. And before we, oh, I look, okay, I was going to make sure that uh, Jean uh, was on for this last question because it's going to be asked um, to, to all of you. So as you all know, we're, we're joined today by colleagues from federal, state, and local oversight entities, which is really exciting to have that type of partnership. Um, and I think what we found at the PRAC specifically is that you know, a key to Agile oversight is, is truly uh, who you know, um, how you work together, um, and how we can all help one another. Relationship building has just been a key for all of us in our work, um, no matter what organization we represent. So as we're starting to wrap up this fireside chat, I'm curious if you all might share your thoughts on how we can all continue to not only build relationships and, and forge partnerships, but also how we might be able to be to more effectively leverage the work of one another, um, federal, state, and local, to to be more agile in all that we do. Uh, so, how about we first start with uh, Michael, and then we'll we'll bring it around to Jean, and then uh, Christy, and then Mike. Great, thanks. Uh, and it's great to have federal, state, and local partners um, as part of this discussion. And one of the things you know I feel proudest of at the PRAC and what we've done is how we've built th those relationships that you mentioned, Matthew, and, and working with state and local colleagues, um, as well as um, 
bringing us to an even closer relationship with Gene's team at GAO and, and their folks. We went into this pandemic, from my standpoint, I think in a very good, strong relationship with Gene, GAO, the team there, that's just grown stronger, I think, over time because of um, all of the issues that we've had to deal with to make sure we're complementing each other, as Gene said at the outset. Uh, there's plenty of work for us to do without fighting over who gets to do you know, which job. Um, so the question is partnership, the question is relationships, the question is trusting each other and sharing information with each other um, and going in with that kind of a mindset. But what has changed, I think, for federal IGs through this pandemic, and I've seen it at the PRAC and working with IGs like Mike and Christy and others, is their commitment to partnership with colleagues at the state and local level. And again, I'll give a shout out to Gene for heightening my awareness to that when I've been part of meetings that he's led where he's brought together leaders at all the different levels. And it was from those that I saw clearly how important it was that we do that. And I've often been um, asked the questions when we do external grant work and external oversight work, um, have we reached out to partners in the communities we're about to go audit in or do work in? Would, of course you would wanna know if the state auditor or the local auditor or the state IG or the local IG or whatever entity under which name it's called has done similar work there. Um, and so I think it's incumbent on us as our jobs are getting more complicated and challenging and the amount of oversight responsibilities that we have continues to grow to make sure that we're partnering with all of the oversight entities who can help us better accomplish our responsibilities. That, that benefits, again, the public. That's what they want. The public doesn't want to see us fighting over whether it's an IG, GAO, the state auditor, the local inspector general getting the credit for the work. They want to know how are we improving? How is the program being improved? How is it being helped? That's our core mission. And by partnering with our colleagues across all levels of government, we improve that. And so how do you do that? I'll just mention a couple of things we've done at the PRAC. We've had regular periodic briefings to provide them with information we're learning, to provide them with fraud alerts, um, to engage with them regularly so that we have open lines of communication, something that um, as you communicate more and more, you end up with greater and better partnerships. Um, and um, of course, we have made pandemicoversight.gov, our website available to host reports of state and local oversight entities. And so those are with, um, on our website. We have been very fortunate to bring on board Elaine Howell, who is the former California state auditor, who um, is a leader in this area, join us to give us advice as a senior advisor. And we started our first ever auditor, state auditor in residence program. And so we have two Tennessee state auditors who have deep experience actually working with us at the PRAP to help us learn and understand um, better and interact at a deeper level with state auditors across the country. So um, we've tried to build on those relationships. And I think that is one of the things that has uh, tr been transformative as we've moved forward through this pandemic in a positive way. Thanks so much, Michael. And we'll actually uh, get to hear from Elaine later today. She has a super exciting presentation that she'll gonna, she's going to give for us. Um, Jean, uh, how about you? Uh, what, what, what do you think about this question? Well, for uh, decades, uh, GAO has been working to build relationships at the federal, state, and local level through the Intergovernmental Audit Forum. Actually, the Intergovernmental Audit Forum was created back in 1972 when the very first uh, generally accepted government auditing standards, or the Yellow Book, was created. And the forums were created as a means of you know, propagating the Yellow Book to become the standards on which auditors 
would audit uh, federal government uh, revenues, no matter whether you were a federal, state, or local auditor, or uh, a um, independent public auditor from public accounting firms auditing federal money is not. So over the years, that intergovernmental audit forum has been maintained. We've used it as a way to build very strong uh, network of, of very uh, you know, talented people working at the state and local level and then the IG community. And we had OMB was involved too in the intergovernmental audit forum. So we were trying to link it to the executive branch policy matters. And then when the single audit function came into being in the 1980s, that forum was also a means of uh, implementing the single audit concept uh, at the state and local level where those audits look at the control environment of all the resources, including federal money, and then do compliance testing against individual uh, efforts. And then, as I mentioned, we brought them in. A lot of the state and local people wrote me back during the uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act in 2009, along with OMB, about having more of a forum and a dialogue. So we set up weekly conference calls at the federal, state, and local level. And then, as Michael has said, we've built on that uh, as we've gone through this pandemic experience. And I'm also working with OMB, Treasury, OPM, through the Joint Financial Management Improvement Program uh, to focus more in the future based upon a lot of the experiences we've had with fraud and improper payments during the pandemic program to work more with the state and local communities. So stay tuned, there'll be a lot more uh, uh, issues uh, to, to build on these relationships and networks down the road. And then lastly, I'd say, you know, I've also implemented these concepts on a global level. You know, I led an effort of national audit offices in other countries because they all had this same issue with the pandemic. They were all were affected with their own operations. Their government spent uh, money uh, dealing with the ramifications of the pandemic. So we put a lessons learned document together at the global level of how all national auto offices around the world were dealing with this issue. And we dealt with some of the donors uh, to the World Bank, International Monetary Fund and others. Uh, and so that's very important. I still lead a working group on financial regulation and modernization based upon the global financial crisis where we're evaluating, uh, there's about 25 or 30 national auto offices evaluating the reforms that were put in place to ensure that there's not a future global financial crisis. And so uh, these concepts apply not only domestically, but internationally as well. And they're very, very important to the effective functioning of our community. And they're also a good way to share best practices, to share methodologies, and to be able to provide this. I also had a, you know, we, we've set up a domestic uh, advisory group here at GAO, federal, state, and local auditors. Michael's uh, been on it over time. And actually, Elaine Howe was on it for many years when she was state auditor at, at California. So th th these are critical. Uh, uh, aspects of how to enhance our profession uh, broadly. Thank you for those fantastic insights, Gene. Um, Christy, uh, what do you think on this question? How can we effectively leverage the, the work of one another, you know, federal, state, and local? I don't want to repeat anything that, um, you know, Gene and Michael have said. Um, if partnerships are just absolutely imperative as we're uh, providing oversight for these really complex programs. Whenever I talk about healthcare fraud, um, I talk about how I know that those that are committing fraud in Medicare are also doing it in Medicaid. And as we are responding to um, pandemic response, uh, one of the very ideas in having uh, PRAC exist is, the, is knowing that fraudsters are going to go after idle paycheck protection, uh, commit healthcare fraud. And we see that, uh, we, we have seen that unfold. 
So uh, those partnerships and being able to share data are just absolutely imperative. Uh, here at HHS, we administer the grant to Medicaid fraud control units of which there uh, is a, a Mafuku in every state in the territories. And they are critical partners for us in being able to identify and work together um, to uh, detect and respond to potential fraud. Uh, state auditors, uh, we use uh, leads from their single state audits uh, to uh, figure out where there might be risks and for us to follow up on. Uh, and so these partnerships are imperative. The one thing that I would just really underscore is the connective tissue um, that needs to exist for all of these partnerships and, um, and that's data. <laughs> we need to be able to have good data, access to data, be sharing data, be able to um, sort of, it allows us to have that heightened uh, transparency to see where money is being uh, spent, how quickly, and for us to be able to work together to respond uh, when, there, when there might be something amiss. So I can't uh, underscore in on the topic of partnerships, um, just how important they are and how important as a tool for them to be maximally effective data is. Thanks for sharing, Christy. And we actually have a panel later in the day talking about this issue of, of sharing data and integrating data across offices to perform um, agile work. So um, thanks for those insights. Uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Mike, what, what are your thoughts on this question? I can clean up after this group is tough <laughs> to, to close out because they've said um, so many, so, so much um, great things. But um, I think for, for my office, an office of my size and the size that we were at the start of the pandemic, where would we be if not for partnerships, if not for leaning on people like um, Michael Horowitz and everyone in my staff knows um, how I feel about, about Michael or Christy or Mike Missile or Bob Westbrooks who was there before or Mary Kendall at Amtrak. I'm not sure um, where we would have been when we were faced with the the challenge we were faced with, especially at the onset. And that's why I've been repeatedly quoted, and uh, Michael as well, as saying that oversight of pandemic economic programs required a whole of government response. And it wasn't just a, a catchphrase, but it, it's true. There was no other way an office of my size could achieve what we have achieved. So a key component to the, the rapid response that we had throughout the pandemic has been our partnerships, both within the IG community, other federal and local state and local partners, as well as with SBA itself. Um, I could give, you know, countless examples, but one of them is the way that um, the PRAC, you know, and the Michael and Bob strengthen our hotline and data and analytics processes, allowing us to detect, detect fraud faster than we could even process it allowed us to be able to stand on our own in, 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 in that regard at this point. At the beginning, we could not. And um, also in, in terms of capitalizing on the partnerships with other, especially the law enforcement entities to stem the tide of pandemic um, fraud. I mean, the dividends that the office has paid in terms of our success could not have been done without those. You know, And um, um, Gene was joking earlier to hear about um, some of those arrests and stuff that, you know, the officers played a role in, but we're up to like over 750 indictments, close to 600 arrests. And our collaboration across the board with the Secret Service and with SBA and with financial um, institutions has resulted in a seizure and return of almost $30 billion to date. Not to mention in terms of agile work products, we have, what, 30 pandemic-related reports 80 pandemic related re um, recommendations. N none of these things are remotely possible for an office of my size um, without those partnerships. So that's the importance. I don't think I need to beat a, uh, to, to come, continue to say what, what needs to continue. I think that's pretty um, evident with what has been said by Gene, Michael, and Christy. So I'll stop there. 
thanks so much, Mike, for, for rounding us out on that. And I would like to say a sincere thank you to all four of you for, for taking the time to share your incredibly valuable insights on this, on this topic. Uh, you've all provided just a great example to follow in terms of not only producing agile work, but also shifting the culture of how oversight can be conducted. Um, I think it's clear that teamwork at all levels of government and the empowerment of staff across organizations is incredibly critical to the success of our offices in being able to provide effective and timely oversight across the government. So this has served as a great way to stop, start off this event and you know gear us up to to talk about the different aspects of, of agile and that we're gonna that we're gonna get into in just um, just a little bit. So again, thank you so much. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over to Amanda Cease to get the rest of the event rolling. Take care. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.